from Kona to Yan'an, The Political Memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter 10, Chiang Kai-shek's China. In June 1944, the director of the Office of War Information in China came to observe our Burma Front psychological operation. He said that the Kuomintang government had finally lifted the ban on Nisei from China. He recruited me and three members of my team for his China operations. Only a few times have I been moved so deeply by the sight of land as I was when I saw China for the first time from the sky. As we descended from high altitude after flying over the Himalayas, I saw scarred land down below, showing every mark of human toil. Small blocked-off farms stood side by side, and every valley and hill, some steep and as high as mountains, was cultivated to the very top. From the sky there was so much beauty on the face of the good earth that peasants tilled to make productive. Yet when I went out to visit the rice fields and farms around Kuniming in the short time we stayed there during the early summer of 1944, I saw a picture of poverty and struggling humanity which in many ways made me recall the lean years we farmers spent on coffee farms in Kona. But here the conditions were much worse, with a brutal sharecropping system where the landlords took from 50 to 60 percent of the crop for land rent alone. I had little to do then so I watched the peasants toil from early dawn to nightfall. When I went into the city of Kuniming I saw pompous, porky and smooth-skinned landlords drinking and dining and wasting food. All this reminded me of the feudal Japan which my parents had left to work in the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii as contract laborers. Mother frequently told us stories of planting rice in paddies, of the high land rent, of the tea houses which the well-to-do patronize, and of the daughters of poor peasants who were sold to the tea houses so that the families would be able to pay their debts to landlords. I thought of Georgia, too, of its tobacco road, where the poor whites were so undernourished that they were exhausted before they started the day. Here in China was Tobacco Road, and I asked myself, what was the solution? Just as in the sharecropping South, the problem in Asia was land tenancy. Among the hundreds of millions in Asia, easily 80% lived directly off the land. The pressing issue was land reform. More than 20 years bad passed since the great Dr. Sun Yat-sen had raised the slogan of land to the tillers. But Chiang Kai-shek had not carried out this program. I felt that looking at these problems so far from home made me see conditions in Hawaii with better perspective. There were occasions when I went over in my mind what general points I remembered of the speeches and writings of Hawaii's labor leaders and liberal politicians of the 1930s who influenced my thinking to varying degrees. There were times when I thought of the Crozier brothers, Clarence and Willie, who lambasted the territory's land monopolists during political elections. I could understand land monopoly quite well because I had suffered from it as a farmer. In Kuniming I heard the same distressing voices my ears had become so accustomed to in Colombo and India. On narrow, cobblestone streets of Kuniming I saw G.I.s hurrying away as emaciated, sore-covered beggars and tattered rags ran after them. Joe, no papa, no mama, no first sergeant, old Chinese who don't speak English said, and begging for money. Prostitutes limped up to touch G.I.s along dark streets, rasping, hey, Joe, hey, Joe. Their vulgar, accented English, all that they knew, flowed with a mixture of cussing and swearing they had learned from G.I.s. Like souvenir peddlers and money changers and pimps, these prostitutes used the famed battle cry of Konami. You say how much? They said with a strong challenge, if one even as much as paused or said a word to them. In Kuniming I saw women and children with baskets on their backs going toward the mountains every morning. They returned in the evening with twigs, pieces of wood and other kindling material in their baskets. There was no firewood around the city in its barren outskirts, for scavengers fought for pieces of wood. So many people spent all their days merely trying to provide their families with fuel needed to boil water, for instance, which was polluted almost everywhere. All this was part of the whole life and death struggle going on everywhere. These people had been swept into the backwash of society. Some of them were ex-concubines who had been discarded by rich businessmen or landlords. They were like daughters of poor Japanese peasants who were sold to tea houses to pay off family debts. I frequently heard GIs and officers say that there were too many Indians or Chinese. Their remarks were directed at the poor. If one went out to the countryside to investigate, he would have found that the poor in this semi-feudal economy actually produced the wealth, and the rich took away the harvest of their hard toil. There were too many absentee landlords feasting in the cities. There weren't too many Chinese or too many Indians. There was not an equitable distribution of the fruits of labor. When we arrived in China, our limited troops at forward Chinese air bases were being evacuated as we gave up airfields in the face of Japanese attacks. We heard evacuated GIs grumbling that the American press did not give them the truth about the fighting in China. They told us that the Chinese nationalists were not fighting and had been sitting out the war from about 1940. This was unbelievable to almost every GI who arrived in China, because the American press had been playing up for years nationalist resistance to beat the ban. A few months later this news of non-resistance, which had been suppressed by Chiang Kai-shek's government for about four years, shocked the American public. 
A sergeant, who was thoroughly disgusted, occupied a bunk next to mine at Kuname. He told me of the racketeering Chinese contractors who took American money to build airfields, conscripted peasant labor, and paid them almost nothing. He said the peasants blamed the Americans for this treatment. And when the Japanese drove toward our air bases and bombed them at night, Chinese traders lit fires to mark off target areas. The sergeant was aghast at the passive mood of Chinese commanders, whose first concern was evacuation of family and loot on military vehicles and on wagons they stripped from the local peasantry. They acted like the British colonialists who frantically ran away from Burma, turning guns on natives who wanted to use the roads, river barges, and vehicles. Chiang Kai-shek's army did more, they looted. So bad was the treatment of the local people by Chiang's armies in Honan province the peasants rose up with pitchforks, sickles, and knives to attack General Tang and pose few hundred thousand soldiers. The Iron populace timed their uprising with a Japanese attack and shouted, Better the Japanese than Tang and Po. 300,000 soldiers dropped their rifles and gladly fled. They probably went home to sharecropping, for they, too, had come from farms, and evidently appreciated the feelings of the peasants. Many of them had been dragged into the army by local landlord elements, with hands bound so they could not escape. There were, too, many recruits who were brought to the American training center in Kuniming who had been impressed into military service in this manner. But porky landlord's sons and young slick-haired speculators in the cities were never drafted. Soldiering was the most degrading profession in China and the poorest were impressed into it. What were they fighting for? Did they know? These and other questions made me observe the peasants in uniform closely. I am of the generation that was drilled in school with the concept that freedom is absence of restraint. Freedom meant the right to say what we wanted, to befriend whoever we wanted to, to write what we wanted and to read what we wanted. There was a time when this explanation satisfied me, but by the time I arrived in Asia as a GI, I clearly saw its many limitations. In India, for example, I saw countless people spending all their hours from dawn to dusk begging for food and money. Many of them carried children in their arms and shoved the tiny, starved bodies right in front of your face and asked you to look at them. Is there freedom here? I asked. Does freedom to them mean the right to read, write, speak and assemble? Freedom explained in this sense, as we had been taught in our schools, was incomplete. They had no leisure for these activities, for they were engaged day after day in the fundamental task of seeking meager supplies of food. They were as badly off as or worse than the primitive man who spent all his time hunting and fishing. The primitive man, too, was not free, for while he had no one to exploit or oppress him, he was a slave to nature. As man extends his control over nature, that much more his freedom grows. In the West, particularly in our universities, we had heard of Chinese philosophers and classics. Yet as we moved around the cities and countryside, we saw that education had been and still was a privileged thing for a few of the upper class. The masses, who we saw begging, peddling small items, or toiling the fields of India and Kuomintang China, had no leisure or means to study, to read, or to come in contact with new ideas. Feudalism was a root cause of this poverty and ignorance. Squeezing of these weaker Asian nations by foreign powers was another cause. Freedom therefore meant, as I observed in the towns and countryside, complete sovereignty of these nations and the development of their productive resources to benefit the millions of underprivileged. It would mean, then, more schools, the introduction of new ideas, electric lighting for reading and discussion rather than dim candlelight or going to bed early, pure tap water in one's home, rather than walking hundreds of yards for a bucket of polluted water, electric and oil burning stoves, and increasing the wealth of the country by improved means of production, which actually is the key to liberation for the millions who spend many hours doing chores which should take but minutes in this day and age. During our war against Japanese militarism, there were extremely few influential Japanese living abroad who were fighting the regime in their native country. The name of Ikuo Oyama was prominently mentioned in the U.S. In the early part of the Pacific War, we heard of no other. This Japanese statesman, who was a veteran of the Japanese diet and a militant liberal, lived in Chicago as a political refugee and taught at a university. He had fled Japan during the 1930s, when political repression grew stronger as the war financiers and the militarists pushed onto the Asian continent and carried aggression into Manchuria and China. In the U.S., he worked closely with our government. Footnote. Ariyoshi continues, after the war, Oyama, who had been the leader of the Worker Peasant Party, returned to Japan and again became a member of the Japanese parliament. He became a professor at the Waseda University. His colleague in the former party, Senji Yamamoto, who had also been an outspoken anti-militarist in parliament, had been assassinated before Oyama fled Japan. Elder statesman Oyama is known for his contributions in introducing democratic ideas into Japan through his writings and lectures. When Oyama stopped over here in Honolulu on his way back to his native country after the Japanese surrender, he told guests at a banquet given in his honor that the U.S. government had requested him to go to Japan as a sort of representative for this country. 
he said he refused. He wanted to return home as an independent person to participate in the democratic reconstruction of his country. He is now a leader of the liberal bloc and one of the most prominent in the peace movement which is opposing rearmament. He is against the unilateral peace with the Western bloc. He recently received the Stalin Peace Prize. Honolulu record the 20th of March 1952, 1. Footnote end. While we were behind barbed wire in the watchtowers of Man Center, while in the military training camps and in India, we Nisei Gis wondered if there were any others like Leama on the Asian continent. Then on the Burma front in the late spring of 1944, we heard of Kaji Wataru, a Japanese anti-fascist writer. Ever since that day I had wanted to meet him. I wondered how he re-educated the Japanese soldiers who were deeply indoctrinated with the teachings of emperor worship and Bushido. I wondered how he made the Japanese prisoners of war discard their deep contempt for people they regarded as ragged, cowardly, and inferior. How long did it take Kaji to convert them from fanatic soldiers, who would rather commit suicide than be captured, to willing propagandists for the Chinese army? In China I heard his name more frequently. Almost every Chinese intellectual and American correspondent knew him personally in the wartime capital of Chongqing. I remember the morning we met Kaji and his wife, Yuki Aikta, in the OWI director's office at Chongqing. I had imagined that Kaji would be stocky and rugged. Instead, we Nisei met a short and slender man with kindly, doe-like eyes. This was the exiled left-wing writer who had shaken the cockiness of the Japanese military brass in China. I say had shaken because when we met him he was virtually a prisoner of Chiang Kai-shek's government, which had turned its efforts away from the anti-Japanese war and was preparing for the anti-communist war which it would engage in after the Allies defeated the Japanese. Yuki Aita was very attractive and she conversed brilliantly. From the first meeting, she impressed me as a sincere person and I soon found out that she was the pillar of Kaji's Japanese prisoner re-education program. She was a stabilizing force, a young mother to men who needed new faith after becoming captives of people they looked down upon as their inferiors. She was a student of world politics, constantly studying and applying her knowledge to practical work. When she smiled and talked, you would never imagine that she had been tortured by the Japanese militarists. You would not think that she had fled Japan while very young and danced in the ballrooms of Shanghai to eke out a meager living, all the while suffering from poor health. I met Kaji and Yuki frequently. One evening shortly after I met them, Kaji and I were at a restaurant when the air raid alarm signal went on. The restaurant owner came to us and asked us to leave, saying that there might be an unpleasant incident since Kaji was a Japanese. That night I asked Kaji to tell me his experiences. I wanted to know why the Chiang Kai-shek government, to which he had made vast contributions in the war effort, was not publicizing his activities, particularly the anti-Japanese psychological warfare conducted by him and his converted prisoners. To hear the wartime experiences of Kaji and his wife was to get a general picture of China at war. Kaji told me that he and Yuki fled Shanghai when the Japanese sacked the city. With the help of friends they went to Hong Kong. Again helped by Chinese friends, like China's cultural leader Kyo Mojo, they were brought inland to participate in anti-Japanese psychological warfare. We were convinced that we were ideologically stronger than the Japanese militarists, Kaji said. We thus began appealing directly to frontline Japanese soldiers. Kaji, Yuki and another Japanese, Kazuo Aoyama, were the first to re-educate and use Japanese captives on the front lines in Asia. The task was tremendous, for the Japanese were piling up victories on their side. They made politics their sharp cutting edge, and appealed to Japanese prisoners as peasants and workers who had been forced to fight the peasants and workers of China, all for the profits of the war financiers and military rulers. Was raping and pillaging in China their concept of Asia for the Asiatics or Greater East Asia co-prosperity? Such ideas cut deeply underneath the haughtiness and fanaticism of Bushido. When I went to the front lines with my first group of re-educated prisoners, I had faith in them. I knew they would not escape but direct propaganda attacks against the enemy, Kaji said to me. The first venture was a success. Kaji and his colleagues used a public address system, leaflets and comfort kits with propaganda messages enclosed for Japanese troops. The peasants distributed the leaflets and kits. The Japanese high command took measures to counter Kaji's contaminating effort by shifting frontline troops to the rear and having them replaced. All this occurred during the nationalist communist united front resistance against the Japanese. This was the period following the nationwide student movement which demanded that Chiang Kai-shek fight Japan. It followed the capture of Chiang at Sion by young Marshal Chiang H. Su Liang, whose troops revolted against the Generalissimo's anti-red campaigns. They wanted to fight the Japanese invaders, and this, Chiang was forced to do. During the United Front, it was a people's war. The peasants in the countryside and the merchants in the cities were told what stakes they had in the war. 
they saw that full participation was necessary in fighting the invaders for they had vital interest in the resistance in such an environment of a whole nation fighting a common enemy kaji yuki and ayama conducted their prisoner re-education they were encouraged to do so but in the face of the japanese onslaught the united front cracked first the nationalists wavered and subsequently some of their leading elements under wang ch ching wai went over to the japanese and set up a puppet government at nanking not only on the military front but on political and ideological fronts they collapsed the quisling government of wang ch ching wai in a very illuminating manner served both the japanese and the nationalists as an anti-communist front history has proved that from this time on it was the chinese partisans under communist leadership that resisted the japanese consequently they received the brunt of the japanese attacks they carried this anti-japanese struggle far into the japanese rear to the china coast and into manchuria and the nationalists practically sat out the war kaji told me that when the united front broke and the nationalists began suppressing the liberals and anyone who demanded an all-out anti-japanese war in alliance with the communist-led guerrillas his work with the japanese pow's was stopped he returned from the war front with his converted psychological warfare workers and at the docks at chungking many hundreds of chinese turned out to welcome their japanese allies and pay them tribute but in a few days the prisoner converts were locked up as dangerous elements, although they had faced the Japanese troops on the firing lines with public address systems. I talked to some of them. I was encouraged that even under nationalist suppression, they studied and held discussions in preparing themselves for their roles in a democratic Japan. In observing them I felt deeply that the future Japan belongs to peace-loving people like them. Kaji himself lived like a captive outside Chunking. He was red-baited along with Chinese patriots who wanted to fight Japan. When the Americans arrived in China and set up headquarters, the nationalists made pretenses of using Kaji. They paid him a small subsistence allowance, for Kaji was a symbol of China's resistance. When I met him he was a show-window piece for the Chiang government, and to the credit of Kaji and Yuki they maintained their dignity and did whatever they could for the war effort. Whenever I met them or went to restaurants with them, they would point out Tai Lai agents who kept close watch of them. What is the fundamental reason that the nationalists broke the united resistance with the communists? I asked Kaji. A people's war, he said, brings a new sense of power to the peasantry in rural China. The peasants see they have a stake in the war, that they are fighting in order to better their living conditions. They visualize new hope and not mere empty promises. The warlords, landlords, and bureaucrats in the nationalist regime, who survived by squeezing the peasants, became alarmed. A new challenge had been created, and after the Japanese were driven out, they would utilize their experience to destroy and change the social forms of the past. The British have the same fear of the colonized natives in Burma and Malaya, the Dutch in Indonesia and the French in Indochina, Kaji explained to me. In fighting the Japanese they would learn to oppose the Western imperial powers. Kaji and Yuki were like aliens in the United States today, aliens who have made contributions to this country as labor leaders and civil rights fighters but in reactionary times. As their steadfast views become sharply non-conforming, they are hounded, persecuted and threatened with deportation. Only, aliens in the United States have made this country their home, while Kaji and Yuki wanted to return to Japan after the war. Kaji frequently said that it was unfortunate that he and Ayama were on bad terms. At his request I tried to bring the two together, for both were political exiles fighting the Japanese military rulers. Finally I gave up my efforts when I saw that Ayama was not interested in cooperating with Kaji. I also discovered that Ayama worked closely with Tai Lai agents, popularly referred to as the Chinese Gestapo. Ayama operated quite freely in Chungking. He openly said that he was a communist, but the nationalists left him alone. Kaji, on the other hand, known merely as a left-wing writer, was persecuted. Ayama had a small printing plant. He came to us at the OWI with an offer to let us have it free. Neil Brown, the administrative officer, negotiated for the OWI and I interpreted for him. I don't want a cent, Ayama told Brown. I am a communist so money does not matter. Since he was tied up with Tai Lai, it was safe for Ayama to say that he was a communist. When I told this to Brown, he frowned. Brown told me to feel out Ayama further, for we knew he was not going to give anything free. He repeated that communists don't need money so he was not asking for any from the OWI. We insisted that he had to have money to live. We wanted to agree on a price for his printing plant. He grinned condescendingly, as though pitying our ignorance. As we expected, two days later he sent us a list of his equipment with a price list prevalent in Chung King's black market. Finally, when Brown paid for Ayama's plant, he not only paid the black market price but was forced to hire Ayama's printers at wages he demanded. Occasionally Ayama came to our office with samples of leaflets he had written for the nationalist propaganda department. 
he boasted that the nationalists were dropping hundreds of thousands of leaflets over japanese lines we knew differently hundreds of thousands of leaflets for use against japanese troops were stacked in storerooms coolies slept on them while nationalist officials were content with lining their pockets with funds allocated for leaflet projects 